Anthony Bernan, with us, um, who is a computer scientist but also a researcher and also in the field of, uh, let's say, the open internet since its very inception, in particular uh, for what concerns the free software and uh, the culture of sharing online. Today, he will talk to us about uh, the cultural environment in the online domain, what it means, what it entails, which are the determinants and the ways to uh, improve sharing even in a commercial fashion. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to put this in my life.
first by trying to describe what cultural development or mean, but what, the, what does it mean for individuals to get the best of the possible
anyway, I, I, I keep going and we'll see. Uh, in addition to writing commentaries about the internet, I'm also a practitioner. I mostly of writing literature. Uh, in, in practice, the, the larger part of it is, is poetry. And I'm also a publisher uh, for uh, literature that whose origin, original space of publication is the internet. That is, people who write initially for the web and then we publish their works by redeveloping them so they can become books or, or interactive websites that are editorialized. Uh, and these three perspectives is what I will move uh, in the talk between these three perspectives. That is the, the global analysis, the analysis centered on an individual practitioner, uh, what do you experience, and then the middle level of being a microeconomic actor player, that is a, a small firm that tried to publish in this world. Uh, now, I move to, to the paradoxes and open issues. Uh, I think this is something I am experiencing, but I guess uh, uh, you will see me speaking a lot about uh, blogs and not about social networks, uh, blogs and social media, but not so much social networks. So this may create a gap between what you do and what I am doing, but in reality, I don't, I don't use social networks. Uh, I mean, by social networks, I mean things like uh, uh, really uh, Facebook, uh, Google Plus, uh, and uh, similar stuff. Uh, by social media, I mean things that are, may have social components, but whose contents follow a given media microblogging with Twitter or uh, 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 photographs with things like Pinterest or uh, uh, media blogs with things like uh, Tumblr. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are even familiar with the names I have mentioned. Uh, I may ask at some points when I talk about So. Uh, contrary to what most people say, the blogs that once dominated the, the practice of individuals on the, on the internet, they have not disappeared when Facebook came in place. Uh, they never stopped growing in terms of numbers, but they are much smaller than uh, the number of Facebook accounts. It is, it's around 200 million blogs that are active while they are around 1 billion active Facebook accounts. Now, it's, it's clear to anyone who has, uh, from the experience of discovering every day uh, new interesting blogs, it's, it's clear that if you are interested in some field, some practice, some domain, uh, uh, you probably know only a very limited part of the, the people who write interesting things in your domain of interest. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in practice, if you, if you knew all of them, you would not be uh, in a better situation because clearly you wouldn't have the time to read or view or listen to all they produce. So this is, this is an example of, uh, let's say, as doctoral students, for example, on your subject, you're supposed to read about everything relevant to your subject in terms of scientific papers that have been screened, that have been uh, 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 reviewed before they were published. But as someone who lives on the internet and thinks on the internet, this is not something you can do. So you must re have recourse to other means than the pre-selection. Uh, uh, and of course this pre-selection for journals or for publication is still important, 
but uh, you have to live uh, also with other metals. Uh, how many of you uh, have a Twitter account? So you will explain to the others. <laughs> there is. This is a contentious uh, statement that I'm making then because uh, if you if you look at people who have Twitter accounts, you basically have two types. Uh, you have people who more or less follow uh, or three types. You have, you have people who more or less follow uh, as many people as they have as followers. And then you have new Twitter accounts. And that means, for example, they will have 1,000 uh, followers and 1,000 persons whom they follow. Uh, you have people who just are just coming in to Twitter and most likely they follow more, many more people than fo the number that follows them. Uh, follows is the, uh, Twitter is as a more realistic and concrete words for, uh, so they don't speak of friends and it speaks of subscribers and followers. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, uh, now what I am saying, you have the third category are people who uh, uh, they are full, no matter how many people follow them, they will not want to follow more than a certain number. And of course, the level of this this number is, uh, is very uh, is a choice that will influence a lot what you read or you don't read. Uh, in the sense that uh, what I'm saying here is if you follow 200 people and uh, they, they each of them writes between 5 and 10 or 15 uh, tweets per day, that is small messages. You're likely, uh, that's of course a gross figure, to read only one tenth of the, of the tweets of the people you follow. And, but if you follow uh, 2,000, then you will read only one person. And then you could decide to follow only 20, uh, and you would read everything they write. And what I claim here is that it is a better strategy to stay at this intermediate level where you only sample what you people read but at least you have a chance to discover things that are not obvious to you. Uh, and this is, these this very simple things, uh, how do you deal, uh, how do you position yourself between exhaustiveness and uh, between uh, uh, and the chance to find things by luck or it's called serendipity uh, from the story uh, uh, that uh, holds of a certain of serendip who found many things by chance. And in, in chemistry, for, are you some of you chemical engineers? Uh, uh, no? Uh, in chemistry, many discoveries have been done by serendipity, also, also in medicine. Uh, now, <coughs> this is something you certainly have seen uh, in writing in the press as complaints, uh, describing the internet as a world where everybody is writing and nobody reads. Uh, uh, and that's clearly a statement by people who were used to a world where few people wrote and all the others were supposed to read them. But nonetheless, this is behind that there is a, a real question. It's clear that if everybody is able to publish stuff that targets an undefined audience, and that is Maybe it's five people, maybe it's one thousand, but anybody can access their stuff. Uh, probably we will live in a world where uh, the average audience of people who write will be much lower than what was expected in the world of uh, publication 
that was free street. Uh, and uh, uh, but we are used. We were uh, our expectation were was cut by the model of the ancient world, where, for example, if you publish a book, uh, you you would uh, consider it a success uh, uh, only if it sells at least 1,000 or 2,000 copies, which is, even for books, is absolutely no longer the case. Uh, today, uh, uh, it might be 100 in many domains. Uh, now there is another theme, is the Internet as a democratic promise uh, of enabling anybody to to write and publish. When I say write, it's because I have a, a writer bias, uh, but I mean uh, as well uh, play music uh, and publish it on the web or uh, shoot and edit video and publish it on the web. And so read and write means uh, 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 perceive and produce and publish, uh, but it's not, not at all uh, uh, restricted to text. But uh, there is a very famous book in the history of understanding the world of technology of information, which is a book published by Daniel Bell uh, in, in 1973. It's called Towards a Post-Industrial Society, or the Coming Post-Industrial Society, sorry. And uh, in this book, he says, he describes what will be a world of information abundance. He basically says, uh, uh, you know, you have to be careful because everything will be abundant, but not, uh, I mean, all the information will be abundant, but there are things that will never be abundant. And as an obvious example, he quotes a uh, uh, ranked position. That is, you know, if you, uh, if, if your value system says, I want to be one of the 10 people who are most read, well, there will be only 10 of them. Uh, so it's uh, this absolute positions and also some position of mediation and recommendation, he said, will remain scarce. Uh, now, another thing is it is rumored that the internet and the web is a domain of instantaneity and very brief facts. Uh, that is, people get very quickly or not, but they get very, if they get attention, they get it very quickly and then it evaporates very quickly. But in reality, there is another thing happening on the web which is completely different. It is the accumulation of reputation and attention for anybody who uh, practices a, a, long, a long time. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, and this sort of thing is of zero interest to some economic players, uh, but it is a very strong interest to for cultural development. Uh, so perseverance is a value on the web. And now this is a real paradox in the sense that when I discuss these issues uh, 30 years ago uh, when the start of the internet or, or 20 years ago uh, the start of the web uh, it wasn't clear to me what would happen in the relationship between uh, intangible mediated uh, virtual of them as we wish interaction between people and face-to-face uh, -face interaction uh, even right now it's not a bilateral interaction but it is in reality how we look and listen. Uh, uh, and what has happened has surprised some, but in reality, the development of intangible uh, uh, mediated interaction on the internet and the web has, has revalued and created a high demand for face to face physical interaction. And you see that in all domains, that is the demand for concerts in music or the demand for uh, lectures and interaction with authors in literature or uh, the fact that 
uh, theater screenings of movies uh, that were said to be born to disappear because of internet and no home cinemas. Uh, actually, I've, I've never been as uh, successful in at least in quite a few countries. So the web is not virtual in a dual sense. It's 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 real because what's happening on the web is part of our reality. It's uh, but people uh, uh, can can be hurt or or pleased or moved on the web like they are in another situation. But also it's not virtual because it is it coexists coevolves with performance, with, uh, uh, and for example, uh, I believe the, the MOOCs, that is the massively online uh, open courses, massively open online courses or something like that, uh, right, uh, which uh, some see to be the future of education with a uh, massive uh, uh, presence of pre-recorded courses and you can make your choice listening to the best lecturers in the world. This will only create more demand for going to study with real human uh, teachers uh, with, and attending real lectures. Uh, even when you're not forced to, to go to them to get credits, and even in a world of, of free choice. Uh, now the last, uh, I believe, uh, no. well, the last, the, the almost last uh, paradox or of an issue is that uh, what we do on the web is not just real, but it leaves, it leaves traces, and not just traces that are captured by people to send you targeted advertising or by the NSA to see how the suspect you are of becoming a terrorist or anybody they don't, anything they don't like, but it's also just staying there for anybody to look at, at these traces and, and develop something from them. And these, these traces that we leave everywhere of the web, I, I claim that it is interesting to wonder whether there might be some form of of part of the digital body we are developing uh, spread in the web. I mean, this is really the last one. Uh, if, the, if the average audience per work and per author decreases, just like I said this before, when more people publish, uh, there is not more time to, uh, to read, view, listen. Actually, there is even less time because people spend more time writing and, uh, and also because their writing activities are, or reading activities are spread across more different media. That is, we have lived 60 years with television dominating our time, viewing time, while uh, we were in a situation of complete illiteracy uh, in terms of producing moving image, uh, even though there were at some point uh, uh, hundred million digital cameras uh, uh, in Europe, and today nobody uh, counts because every phone or every photography apparatus is one. So everybody has the means, but it's only recently that the, uh, a real literacy developed in terms of producing audiovisual media. And in such a situation, we have a decrease in, in the average audience per work. If you have five more, five at a given level of relevance, quality, uh, interest, uh, fun of, of, uh, of works, if you have five times more works, you have at least five times less average audience. And this uh, means, we will see that the means to support creative activity, uh, audience is still an important component of it, but it is a decreasing 
component of it in terms of contribution. Now, uh, how many of you have followed the uh, Brett Richman's course in this uh, series of course? Uh, so, uh, uh, because it turns out that totally by chance, uh, Brett, Brett Richman and, and myself, we, uh, we have a, a common source of inspiration which is worked by Julie Cohen. Uh, Julie Cohen is a, a copyright scholar in the, the US. She's a critical copyright thinker, and that's how uh, most people have known her. That is, she was, for example, a very strong uh, critic of the uh, creation of uh, digital rights management, also called uh, technical protection measures. That is, software and hardware technology that tries to control what user can or cannot do with a work. And she, she developed a theory, a theory that, this, uh, uh, that giving this role to technology was in contradiction with, a, with human rights and with a philosophy, previous philosophy of copyright, because uh, uh, to delegate to machines something that should uh, remain a human decision. But uh, besides this type of analysis, Julie Cohen has developed uh, a conceptualization, a theory of uh, uh, what's happening culturally and, and politically, uh, but not in the sense of uh, electoral politics on the web. And it is uh, part of this that I, I want to share with you. Uh, uh, but uh, she's a quite, she's not an easy writer. I mean, she develops very original concepts, but it takes a while to understand them. So I, I'm going to present them in a simplified form, uh, or I hope it is simplified. Uh, but it's, uh, but maybe I'm, uh, I'm not faithful to what she really thinks, I don't know, because I have, I have not discussed it with her. With her. Uh, uh, so basically, I, I, I summarize her, the way she thinks about cultural uh, empowerment or she calls it human flourishing in, in her uh, in a book called the network self that was recommended as reading in the abstract for my lecture uh, and you will have a reference and you can read it chapter by chapter on the net uh, like all my books julie is uh, uh, publishing under uh, free creative commons licenses for uh, uh, books so everybody can access and distribute them but not republish them uh, commercially. So basically, first idea is creativity is inseparable from the decentralized activities of individuals. That is uh, uh, the, the fact of producing statements, even if they are not original, doesn't matter, but the statements that manifest uh, uh, the, uh, the singularity of one person uh, in thinking about the world or producing anything for the enjoyment of others, this is intrinsically uh, attached to the activities of individuals. And the second uh, affirmation is individuals, they are situated, and this is a very uh, uh, important concept because what she means is, in, of course we are situated because we are only at one place at a time, like you are in this room now, huh? but we are, situ we are also situated on the internet. Huh? That's what I, I tried to illustrate when I was speaking about myself knowing only maybe 1% one, one of the blogs that would be of interest to me in a language that I can read. Uh, is that you, you are, by your habits, by the tools 
and services you use, uh, you only have access to a small corner of what is on the internet. And many people uh, sort of complain about that. Uh, and they say, you know, it would be wonderful if we could have access to everything at the same time. There would be no boundary. And in contrast, Julie Cohen says, the fact that we are situated, that we have some uh, domain that is of the domain of our personal and social activity, this is of great value, and the people who want to destroy that, they are actually going to destroy our potential for cultural development. And so, basically, the question she asks is, uh, as we are situated, we see a cultural landscape, that is, we see some words that already exist, some expressions on the public uh, interest that already exist, and, the, and we have access to some tools, some services, and what does this give to us uh, in terms of uh, uh, activities that will help us grow major, learn new things? And, and she, she quotes three types of activities. One is what she calls purposive <coughs> activities, that is, I have a project and I want to realize it. I have, a, I have an already established purpose and I want to realize it. That is, for example, I want to, uh, 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 I don't know, paint, uh, I want to paint between quotes, uh, digital images, and communicate them on, on the web. Or uh, the, second, uh, the second activity I've already mentioned is uh, uh, unpredicted discoveries of new stuff. If you live in an entirely predictable circle of, of the web, then you are unlikely, well, fortunately even things you believe to be completely known uh, often provide disco un unpredictable discoveries, uh, even in a relationship between people. But nonetheless, it's more or less the case that you are exposed to serendipity. For example, if you look at a recommendation system, if a recommendation system is based only on people who uh, uh, have the same taste than you uh, have bought this book, your, this will not provide the same type of, uh, uh, of discoveries that a system which allows you uh, to navigate what people who uh, have, have votes or help uh, or, or light enough to recommend it. And finally, uh, juxtaposition is a very important thing in the sense that uh, if you compare, for example, viewing TV on the web and viewing TV. When you view when you viewing TV on a TV monitor, uh, let's say an LCD flat screen today, or, uh, you what you are going to see is something that has been designed by the TV channel. If you if you view TV on the internet, then most likely you will probably not have it full screen. You will have it. Uh, uh, a small image somewhere in the corner and the rest of what you will see will be partially things you have decided to be there and partially intrusive stuff like uh, I don't even know what was the little thing that got down on my presence asking me if I wanted to subscribe to something uh, and so juxtaposition is important then now she's, what Julie says is uh, you have three types of process. You have the individual finding his or her way in culture. That is, you, I, you know, I want to, I want to find things that will uh, provide emotion to me, or that I will find beautiful, or that are important for a story, or whatever. And I, I, I navigate the cultural world in order to to find them. Uh, then. Uh, and this includes, of course, 
uh, finding your own way to what you want to contribute to the world. Huh? Uh, even very modest things, huh? uh, it's, it doesn't have to become uh, uh, a classic. Or, uh, uh, now you have another thing which is you have a very wide context and this context like for example Google indexing the world uh, and uh, this context is going to influence what, what you see, uh, what, you, what you find uh, and uh, even more than that it is going to format your behavior because for example uh, many people ask the question whether uh, Google is uh, uh, not uh, influencing us by what the ranks of the things that are shown to us in answer to queries. But one of the most important ways in which Google is influencing us is in formulating queries. Uh, it, uh, that is uh, uh, defining how we ask questions. Uh, and actually, we uh, this is obvious with auto-completion of, of a query, but it's also the case without that, because using any search engine, we develop a kind of uh, uh, unconscious knowledge about how to query it that is derived from how it works. And, uh, and the last point she really mentions uh, is that all these activities at the individual level, the social level, and interacting with the global context, they are intrinsically entangled. You cannot uh, separate them one from the others. Now, uh, from that, she, she uh, derives a concept which is, uh, she calls semantic discontinuity, and honestly, for for a while, I wonder what it meant. Uh, so, uh, but basically, what she says is granularity and context matter. That is, uh, it's not, uh, you know, you have some people, and it's important for you to know that they are engineers, and before you know it's, it's a mess to have to deal with all this heterogeneous stuff. Uh, uh, individual blogs uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, or accounts or whatever. Uh, we are going to treat all pieces of information as equal. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, index them uh, semantically and we will have a seamless information world uh, where we can provide a, a elaborate new knowledge and provide answers to what people look for. And this approach, Julie Coens is very much criticizing because she claims there is value in, in not too small a granularity, but is because there is value in context. That is, if someone says something, even if it is a verse in a poem, uh, 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 it's, it is very important to read it uh, with the context in which it, it, its production took place or with the imagination, the, the imagination of this situation would drive the writing of the war. Uh, and due to that, she, she claims that we should value editorialized, but that's the word of myself, not, not of her, but editorialized she says curated spaces, that is space where uh, social processes are controlled by either people who are in charge of uh, facilitating them or by uh, the community as a whole. Uh, uh, Wikipedia can be seen as a curated space, not, not at all as a an archive space, but as a curated space, but where many of the curation, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of curation, because curator is a word for, for museum and that, who curates uh, collections, but in, in practice, 
uh, curating an activity means uh, uh, taking care of making this activity interesting by, uh, uh, by, by promoting what makes it interesting and trying to avoid what uh, 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 pollutes it. Uh, now, uh, I have included a long quote, it's not for you to read it now, but it's for you to, since I am interpreting a lot and translating in other words, uh, I wanted to be sure that you had uh, access to a real source, so uh, I, I advise that you read more than these two paragraphs, actually, but uh, if you uh, uh, if you don't, at least you, you will have an idea of what she says. And the important thing is that if you accept that there are, there are boundaries on the web, not, uh, not boundaries that it is forbidden to trespass like uh, for our Europe, for many migrants, huh? but boundaries that have been constructed to, to be the realm of one, of one activity. It's valuable. Uh, because it will, uh, uh, it will help us produce our own interpretation and meaning uh, in this, inside this boundaries. Now, I come. Uh, I would like, I would, I would like to leave 15 minutes at least for questions, and we have a little more if you have any questions. Uh, because the next course is only half an hour later, but you will, you will need rest. So I really want to absolutely finish in uh, my, my own lecture in 25 minutes. And by the way, uh, if there were things up to now that were unclear, you don't have to wait till the end to ask because you will have forgotten that. So interrupt me in that case. Uh, uh, I, have, I told you I want to address what can favor or on the contrary um, cultural development of each person at three levels. And the first level is uh, what I, uh, here I call generative technology. Uh, that is, is, which tools do you use? Uh, which uh, applications and services do you use? Uh, and uh, also uh, something which is a bit different, which is uh, uh, who controls uh, the parameters that has, have been described by Julie Cohen. For example, who controls, uh, uh, who accesses which information at which time, who controls, uh, who can comment and how, uh, and things like that. There we have a big problem, is that uh, if you are in a purposive activity, like uh, writing your PhD, the last thing you want to do is to spend much time wondering about what is the right tool uh, to use uh, for, I don't know, uh, uh, your bibliographic database, uh, your uh, uh, which uh, text producing production tool you are going to use. Most likely you are going to see what is used in your environment that and if you depart from that your environment will severely punish you uh, and but uh, in in life external to the academic world uh, it's even worse because we are not speaking of a freer project where you can spend time to problematize which tools you're going to use we are speaking of activities that have a time range often of a few days or, uh, uh, or sometimes a few hours. And in this context, the more creative you are or you want to be, the less you have time to think about uh, which tools you want to use. Uh, and this is a, a tension not just for individuals. For example, I, I, am, I, I am one of the organizers of a group that defends human rights in the digital world. We are supposed to be experts in tools and we use them to, in a total chaos. 
partic even more of the chaos because we are experts. So we, we can put in place each time we have a thing we want to do, we put in place the first tool that is wrong. And we, we, are, we have never time to really problematize. What I mean by problematize is uh, questioning and finding better uh, answers are usage. So uh, this is a tension is not going to disappear. Uh, but the only chance uh, is that one day, he, in, in unconsciously, it will become uh, like when you write literature. Because when you write literature, the way you use the language, which is uh, uh, is inseparable from the meaning for, for uh, that is uh, writing things in a given manner. I mean, it's not like uh, maybe when something is finished, a writer will tell you, you know, this this stylistic choice was uh, 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 I choose it uh, because I. Uh, 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 it, uh, it has this effect or whatever. But this is not how it happened in the, in the back room. In the back room what happens is uh, you are driven to write in a given manner, uh, in an inseparable manner to the, uh, the, the purpose, often not so conscious of what you try to achieve. And this one day might be like that, that is on the internet we will have derived enough uh, knowledge of what tools are, are good or not and we will be able also to create or adapt new tools in a manner that we will consider use of tool as a writer considers style uh, and for example writer, good, good writers in my opinion they don't use uh, always the same type of style when they address different subjects now, uh, what are the parameters you can decide, uh, you can use to decide whether you want to use a tool or an application and not others? Uh, so I, I, I give answers to that at three, uh, in three situations. That is, one is the in expression of the individual. And uh, uh, the first requirement is intimacy. You know, in, uh, I, I use intimacy there because uh, in most uh, Latin countries we, we make a completely wrong translation of privacy. Uh, we think privacy means protection of private life or protection of uh, personal data and it's not what it means. Uh, privacy means intimacy. Uh, intimita. Uh, and, and, uh, and what does it mean here? It means nobody should read my drafts uh, unless I decide that I want to make my drafts public. And uh, there is, uh, if you have seen uh, Citizen 4, the Laura Pratras film about the, the, the Snowden, uh, it was Snowden, when during the time he was making his revelations, uh, you will. There is a striking moment when Snowden says, as, a, as an intelligence analyst, I could see uh, if, if you were an individual that was targeted, I could see your thoughts as they were forming, because I could see that in your draft, you write a word and then you cancel it and then you put another word at its place. This is the one thing you don't you don't want anybody else to see. Uh, maybe you want people, but then it's an artistic act to make it known. Uh, now the other thing is, uh, uh, you know, you want to, you have a new project, you want to create a blog. Uh, in ten, uh, uh, ideally, you want it to be there in two hours. Okay, so you, you will go to a blog platform, and, uh, uh, and you will, uh, uh, for example, wordpress.com uh, uh, and, uh, and they will offer you uh, a free uh, blog uh, or a commercial package or pro package. The commercial package is 80, 80 euro per year. 
the commercial package will provide you the hosting, will provide you uh, your personal domain name, uh, uh, and uh, 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 but it will also provide you absence of ads. And uh, and but of course, you know, uh, yeah, if you are in a hurry, also maybe uh, uh, you know you will never be reimbursed for this spending if you take the commercial package, or simply you are under the dictator of a, of a gratuity of a free of charge, and you will so we go for the free uh, uh, the free option, and they are very smart. But is the ads you will never see them. They don't show them to uh, the, uh, the author of the blog. They show them only to readers. And not all readers. Readers who they think they, there is an interest to show. And so, of course, it's not WordPress who is deciding that. It's their advertising partners. So, uh, uh, and one day, you will have a friend writing to you, uh, you know, that below. Uh, uh, below your post uh, uh, about politics or, or your beautiful poem or whatever, there was an ad for this crap stuff that you hate. Uh, and, but this is, this is what is meant by, this is one element of controlling form and context uh, in the sense that uh, if you want to control the con a minimum, the con the form and the context should be in the end of the author of something and the reader. You can, uh, uh, for some authors, we like the readers to be unable to change the form, uh, but they are wrong. I mean, they, they, at least they are wrong in the internet world, if they were not before. And, uh, but the third party who has interests that have nothing to do with you, uh, he, you don't want them to. And then there are issues like curation, or, or uh, curation is things like uh, uh, will I allow anyone to, to put comments, uh, do they have to register to put the comments, uh, or will I approve comments automatically if I have already approved a comment from the same person, things like that. These are things that uh, are, are very complex decisions actually. Uh, depends also on how, how much you want comments. Now, if you are a group, for example, uh, an NGO that uh, wants to send, uh, uh, serve some aim, or uh, a small uh, webzine that wants to be visible, a webzine is just a equivalent of journal with several authors on the web. Uh, you want you want to be visible. Uh, you want to be able for people to recommend what you're doing. You want to have a synergy with other projects in your domain. And uh, finally, you want to have some power of influence. Uh, now, how, uh, <coughs> is I have a sort of a uh, I will just elaborate on this issue of recommendation because recommendation on the web uh, is, is, a, is critical. That is, uh, today, uh, very few people find an interesting content by search engines, uh, contrary to all the people who said uh, search engine optimization with link. Uh, most people find them by some form of recommendation. It can be a recommendation by large uh, companies, or it can be a recommendation by friends, uh, or it can be a recommendation by people who you don't know, but they know about you. Uh, and uh, if you look, uh, for example, Twitter, which for expression is still a relatively good tool, for recommendation as a major flow, is that any link you provide in a tweet, will uh, be transformed under the name uh, making it shorter but in reality already also transformed if it is already as short as it can be uh, into a tweet that goes through Twitter which means that when someone recommends something on Twitter 
Twitter will know everybody who followed that this, re this recommendation. And that's where they grab by, uh, by knowing what people like. Uh, and so this is, this is something that communities need to organize themselves, like they did uh, in the pre-Web 2.0 era, uh, when, or at least when Web 2.0 meant self-organization between communities uh, with, with tools like uh, Reddit, Technorati, and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I want I mention words, you would have to look yourself because if I explain all of what they are. Uh, finally, there is the infrastructure. The infrastructure is which tool you are using, uh, uh, which hardware you are using, uh, for which hardware or device are you writing, uh, uh, And how do you want? It's it's a huge continent, and I have no time to address it all. But uh, so I will just follow the question of closed devices. I mean, because we have seen a major with the emergence of mobile internet, which is quite recent huh? in practice, because uh, uh, it's not the same thing that the emergence of mobile phones. Uh, with the emergence of my mobile devices that access the internet we have seen major regression in the control of users on what, what they can write, what they can read, how they can... And an example, for example, uh, uh, it's, it's an extreme example, and, uh, but uh, uh, we publish... Uh, the, the, the publishing firm in which I, I am an associate, we, we used to publish a journal, and each issue of a journal was, was uh, in answer to a sentence. And the sentence was a quote from a writer. And so one day, and because it was using advanced uh, EPUB features, it was targeted at the iPad. Uh, uh, because this was the only device that at the time uh, supported the advanced features of the uh, EPUB 3. And so one day we wrote, we use as a sentence, a uh, sentence from uh, Arthur Rimbaud's uh, poem, the, Illumi the Illumination, that says, our, our bones are, are uh, uh, now covered with an amorous body. And of course you can imagine what type of text this uh, uh, generated, but the text Apple doesn't care about, because they, uh, they think, uh, uh, because uh, uh, apparently, U.S. parents do not complain about their children reading texts that they don't have read. They care only about images. So, Apple censored our, our, our journal uh, issue. Uh, on, uh, so, Apple, in his iBooks uh, uh, software to produce ebooks, has, has clauses that say we cannot do with this tool. If you produce a book with this tool, you can only sell it on Apple iTunes and you cannot write stuff that disparages Apple. Uh, and imagine, you know, ten years before, if Microsoft had said that about the software, uh, everybody would, would have uh, uh, been so infuriated that they would have to backtrack. But it's not the case. I mean, you know, Facebook similarly has censored the, the painting, the origin of the world of the, the staff uh, or has censored the full block of someone because he had reproduced this painting. Now, uh, Raimondo promised that I, I would speak about uh, the condition of existence of uh, uh, of non-market activities, and indeed I've read, I've written a lot about that, but I won't have time to elaborate much. Uh, so, uh, but basically, uh, the key question is: it's not because an, an activity is outside the markets that it does not generate directly income, 
but you don't need uh, something to support it. If you simply, because for example, if I go back to the example of a blog, a demanding blog, a blog that wants to become uh, better with time, is very, uh, uh, consumes lots of time, and most people who stop writing blogs say, either they say, uh, it was using too much of my time, or they say, the oh, I got bored doing it for so few readers. But, uh, but in practice, this issue of free time is essential. And in our, in our real world, free time is connected to not having to use this time to develop, uh, to, to get enough to pay for your housing and your food and your clothes. And so, uh, free, uh, there is a real issue of subsistence for people who engage in sustained creative or uh, expressive activity. But even more, there is an issue uh, of uh, uh, being able to engage in projects where you will gain more know-how, uh, including by taking courses. I mean, a typical example is uh, instrument playing or, or uh, writing, writing workshops. Some of them are free. But most are not. Uh, and uh, so, um, I have a problem of that the full screen is too much, too much full screen. Uh, so, the last thing I, I want to say on this is to mention that there are, there are, three, uh, there are three main schemes of uh, uh, that have been. Imagine to, com to complement income from, from markets to enable non-market activities. Uh, one is basic income, so it's uh, installing a, a, a general income for everybody who is a citizen of one country or resident of one country and this is very uh, this is something that has never been started out uh, uh, because of course uh, uh, if you uh, if you decide suddenly that Italy will give uh, 800 euro per month uh, to everybody who resides in Italy uh, uh, something which is usually a fiction the notion of uh, appel d'air vraiment comme si bien en italien the, uh, the fact that when you have void uh, creates uh, air wants to flow in. So this is an argument that is used against granting rights to migrants because if they are, their situation is too favorable and more migrants will come. It's completely wrong when in this context, but if you offer 800 euro to every resident, it will become true. Uh, and so uh, the minimum the basic income is a wonderful idea, uh, which I have been following and supporting for many years. Uh, uh, because it, the idea is everybody has enough to subsist, and then whether you get more, want to get more money by working, or you want to engage in public interest activity without getting more money, is your own choice uh, or personal activities. It's a wonderful idea, and the world works a bit like that because distributive income is a more and more important share of income of people statistically except that it is done in a manner that does not free time for people on the, con on the contrary people who i don't know i think in Italy the situation is worse uh, in terms of uh, uh, allocations for unemployed but in france basically we have uh, when you fall out of the allocations, unemployment allocations, then you are under a system which is called uh, solidarity income. But the solidarity income is not solidarity, it's, 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 it's a minimum income that will uh, be associated with many constraints on spending all their time to become more employed. So, it, uh, so basic income is a great idea, it's partially implemented in a wrong manner and nobody knows how to implement it uh, 
uh, in uh, a, diff uh, a manner that will be sustainable in the long term. Uh, then you have proposals like the ones I have developed myself that basically say in various domains we need different sources because we need different rules about who gets supported uh, and, uh, and for what. And uh, so we could uh, use, make a scheme like everybody pays uh, uh, 5 euros per month to support creative activities that uh, are uh, fuel freely shareable material on the internet. Uh, and, uh, but we will let people decide who gets the support by various means, on which I don't have time to elaborate. Uh, uh, and then you have, but this is statutory, that is, people are forced they, by law to contribute. And then you have voluntary resource pooling in participatory financing, which you probably all know uh, from Kickstarter or, or whatever. And this is a wonderful scheme, like all the others, uh, except one doesn't know exactly how much it will scale up. Uh, even though it has already scaled up more than we believe possible in the issue. Which I'm not uh, exaggerating. I'm saying that I mean, 
they, they can't, there are many fields that consider uh, people, the fact that people cannot improve uh, without knowing the real stuff, they will not ask the stupid questions, but this stupid question sometimes we regret for them not to have been asked earlier. Uh, now, the key question maybe is, can we adapt to the reality of what an audience is in this new world? But it's can, and this is truly difficult, because uh, as I said, our expectations have been uh, shaped by what an audience were in the era of cultural industry. And uh, now we, we have to admit that, uh, you know, for example, I, I, I write uh, a poetry blog, uh, which is among the few tens of uh, uh, read poetry blogs with uh, regular publication uh, that get some attention. Uh, in, in France, in French. This means when I publish a poem, and they are very short, my average readership is between 20 and 30. Uh, uh, and you have to understand that this is one. You are unlikely to get more, except for a very few people in this uh, 10 most read uh, world. And also, it is enough for cultural development. And this is the, the, the real connect thing that is connected to the subject. It is enough if among these people there are people who provide directly or indirectly a valuable feedback. Indirectly meaning, for example, by what they write themselves. Uh, uh, and now, maybe the most difficult cultural challenge is uh, the, the internet and digital technology is giving each of us uh, much extended capabilities. Would be for some things it would be a wonderful world if it would not give them also to everybody else. Uh, and the, the fact that it is giving them to everybody else and that people want to use them for other purposes than, than ours. Uh, uh, this is something that is a real uh, uh, democratic challenge. In a sense, it's a challenge for our own acceptance of democracy. And I don't know if you have read a piece, uh, an opinion editorial by Umberto Eco, in which uh, Italian journal, where he was claiming uh, basically that uh, the internet was uh, giving the, uh, the world. Uh, uh, the ability to speak uh, publicly to morals uh, and treating them on the same ground than Nobel Prizes. And he said, okay, it's giving, it's giving the floor uh, in this publication space to people who, who would say a stupid thing in, in a cafe uh, at, at the counter. But the strange thing, is he, he, he believes it's okay for people to say stupid things in a, in a cafe at the counter. But he believes it's not okay for them to say them in, on the internet. And this is very surprising because it means that he reads the internet as if it was a published book. And uh, while uh, the internet is something where you must be yourself in the position of reading like an editor would decide whether he will be fine valuable or not what one reads. Thanks for your attention. So, uh, even though theoretically we have only seven minutes, I think we keep it 15 minutes unless you, you are in a rush to, for a pause before the next course. Uh, and I think it's the supposed to do to, to a certain thing. What? Okay. So this uh, only the only first one is uh, difficult. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, comments are, are yes, please. Uh, so in the beginning of your lecture, in one of your 
slides uh, report that uh, our human is situated both in physical and in digital world. And whatever you do, uh, you leave, whatever footprints you leave, it creates a digital body of yourself. Yeah. So uh, what we have studied or what we think for the, uh, for the years, uh, what is our belief, that a man, a man is divided into a spiritual body, a physical body, and now, now he is subdivided into a digital body. <laughs> so, so we know that uh, if, uh, the food of your spirit, spirit comes from your God, your physical body, uh, uh, it is food divided by this world. So, how do you feed your, feed up your uh, digital body? And who is the boss, ultimate self of this digital body? Uh, I mean, uh, well, that's, that's a very deep question. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, the reason why some people have developed an idea that the traces of individuals on the internet could be treated uh, as uh, body parts uh, is because uh, for the physical body uh, uh, there is a way, uh, for example, for blood or for uh, uh, serum, or for cells. Or for, uh, there, there has been a theory uh, that has developed that. Uh, there is a requirement for integrity of the, the human body for the person. So in, when you treat it, you cannot, uh, for example, this leads to the fact that you, you cannot uh, sell organs. Or, it's a bad thing to do so, or, uh, uh, to, to want to buy organs from people and or to drive them to sell them. But at the same time, there might be a collective interest in maybe in the circulation of some body parts, right? like for example, collecting blood or transfusion. Right? Well, now, if you go to, of course, uh, I do believe that this treatment of uh, your digital traces can create pain, but I wouldn't claim it's the same claim of pain than the one that is. is uh, 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 created by hurting your body eh? or yourself or your uh, your example. Eh? I, I, I must say that I, I do not have the same conceptualization but I respect uh, this one. And so uh, now to go to your real question is who, who is who creates, who is the, uh, the guide or the uh, 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 I would say is the individuals, the other, for me, is the, the other persons who have treated it uh, respectfully, but from their own viewpoint, these traces. Eh? That is, that's, that's the only answer I, I can provide. That is, it's uh, 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 basically, you could say, much, much more simple terms, uh, it's our, our digital friends uh, who are uh, the creators of our digital body parts. And uh, my other question was, uh, what is the what is the food of your digital body? What is the food? The uh, food. Uh, uh, how how is it? Uh, what is the food for your digital body? Because yes, that's, that's I, think, I think we. That's yes, what uh, digital scientists does. There uh, are very few uh, uh, data scientists available in this world, and uh, what they does, they collect your data. But and it's and a, they, they know, know about yourself. They, 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 know, they, are, they know about your physical self, they, they know about your spiritual self. And uh, so that was my, my question that who is the boss of this? Uh, well, the forbidden for This is who is the boss of that is uh, the object of, I believe, the most important struggle of the years to come. I, I mean, Unfortunately, it's a struggle which should have been consciously started 10 years ago, but we are 10 years late in understanding that if we let people be uh, 
uh, we let large corporations or uh, state powers or uh, uh, even uh, 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 even in some cases religious powers uh, decide to be uh, the bosses of uh, 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 the only one who can assign meaning uh, or use use technology to assign meaning that is when then used to format your real behavior uh, which is uh, because that's the, that's how one should think about uh, about Google this is not as someone who wants to sell more products by targeted advertising the aim of a company like Google is uh, formatting our behavior not formatting uh, in general and buying or consumption is only a very limited part of it so this is the object of the struggle so when I answered you know it's better if it's your friends it's better if it is your uh, your communities of interest your communities of practice uh, uh, the people with whom you share values who are going to care for your digital body I mean that now who fuels the digital body what fuels it it's clear that the first thing that fuels the digital body is the physical body uh, in, my, in my sense the sense that when uh, when let's say I, when I I realize I'm not able to write anything but even pleases me, the first thing I do is I go outside in the, in the world and I, I say, okay, I'm going to leave a little and then I will have again uh, something maybe to tell. Don't know if answers your question. Any more questions? Uh, you can find me on the internet and if you have any afterthoughts about the question, but if you have it just on ready now, please make it now. Okay, so get yourself some uh, water. And <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank you again.